chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. We're going to look tonight at the story of Jesus in the storm on the boat with his disciples in verse 22 of Luke chapter 8. Um, the Sea of Galilee, where the disciples are and where most of the disciples had spent most of their, their entire lives, in fact, uh, Peter, James, and John make their living from the Sea of Galilee. They were fishermen. Um, it, the Sea of Galilee is in a basin, like in a bowl. It's surrounded by hills. It's almost like down in a valley. And it, was not a, it would not be uncommon even today for the cold air that comes from northern Israel, like in the Golan Heights, to blow down and meet with the warm air that comes up from the desert, and massive storms are produced like that in just a matter of minutes, almost like hurricane force kind of storms on the Sea of Galilee. Now, the fishermen had seen a lot of storms. Uh, Peter, James, and John and the others had seen storms. They had apparently never seen one like this. One, uh, one scholar in, in, in writing on this one storm, he says it almost has a demonic force behind it. So they are terrified. So look with me in Luke chapter 8, verse 22. One day he got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out and as they sailed, he fell asleep and a windstorm came down on the lake and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him saying, master, master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves and they ceased and there was a calm. He said to them, where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even winds and water? And they obey him. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you once again and ask that you would bless the reading and the preaching of your word. This is not my word, it's your word. And we know it does, it never returns to you void. So Lord, I pray that it would accomplish exactly what you want it to accomplish this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. So storms reveal... Storms reveal a hidden reality that we can't see. We think we know ourselves, we think we understand the world, um, and we don't. Storms, like a crisis, reveal something that we can't see about ourselves or understand about ourselves, and they come to the surface really quickly. If you've ever, ever been through some great difficulty in your life, one of the things that it does is it reveals something about you, it reveals something about the people around you, kind of you can't fake anymore. You can't be a phony anymore. And so here are the disciples with Jesus in the boat. Something is revealed. There are actually three things that are revealed. There's something that's revealed about the world, the world we live in. That's our first point tonight. The second, there's something that is revealed about Jesus in this storm. And then finally, there's something that's revealed about us, like the disciples. So let's look at our outline together, and then you can go to like back porch, wherever you're going, uh, wherever you're going tonight. Um, so What's revealed about the world? That's an interesting thing to say. Why would I say that something is revealed about the world that we live in in this storm? Well, we talked a little bit about last night, and we've, we've mentioned it. The world is a ruined paradise. It's a broken place. When I say it's a ruined paradise, I use both of those words intentionally, ruined paradise. It's a paradise. There are still wonderful things about it. Has anyone seen? You've, you've seen the ocean and all the different shades of like aqua and blue and green. That's amazing. That's, that's paradise. That is good and wonderful and beautiful. But guess what? There's also a lot of horrible things in this world. Uh, disease. There's war. There's, there's weirdness in relationships. There's hatred. There's death that we live in a ruined paradise. And this passage reveals that we live in this type of world. And it's a world that you cannot control, even if you follow Jesus. Okay? So we've been talking about Jesus and how wonderful Jesus is and how glorious Jesus is, but we still live in this world and we die too. We live in a world that we can't control. And this storm is really, really important. The storm and the sea in the ancient world was the symbol of a world that was uncontrollable. The sea 
and storms on the sea was, were, were the very embodiment of chaos and confusion and death. It was, to put it this way, the scariest possible thing for these disciples. The scariest possible thing. They actually would create these gods, like Baal was one of the Canaanite gods. He was called the rider on the storm, the rider on the clouds. There were coins, even they, have, they dug up coins of depictions of Baal on top of the storm because they, they felt like they had to appease this god on top of the storm. They were totally afraid of going out of the water and a storm hitting them. And here it is, and they're with Jesus, and Jesus is asleep. You see the point? Surely, like following Jesus, they were like, you know, it was going to be a stroll. Like, surely following Jesus was going to fix the world and make my life easier. And maybe when I go back and I get on the bus here and I leave, I've had this great experience with Jesus. And we're all singing and we're laughing, we're having fun. And you go back to your world and it's the same world that you left. The same junk that's in Georgia and Alabama and Missouri and Michigan and Tennessee. The same mess is still there. How do we square this Jesus that's powerful and loving with the world that we can't control? The reality is, folks, we have some serious messed up expectations about what we think life is about. I was taught, not explicitly, but sort of implicitly, I was taught growing up that I was going to figure life out at some point. That I was going to figure life out that if you did the right things, you went to the right schools, and you tried really hard, and you did all the things, that somehow you figure life out, and you got married, and you had kids, and you took a picture, and you're all wearing white shirts on the beach, right? Like I was taught, here's the point, I was taught that you're going to arrive at a place that you can control life. I was even taught that somehow Christianity, this is a real Bible-believing church, these people love Jesus, that somehow Christianity was going to help me along the road to my American dream. But something happens is that life falls apart. And you move on from plan A to plan B, and you're not as cool as you used to be. Maybe you move on to plan B to plan C. Oftentimes, bitterness sets in. I'm saying this because I've ministered to people who thought they could fix life if they had enough money, if they had enough beauty, had enough power, and they have Jesus on top of it all, and they find themselves boiling their hearts in amusement, boiling their hearts in the next round of golf or the next vacation or the next meal or the next deal. But the whole time, reality is hitting them in the face. Reality hitting in the face that you live in a world that is scary and mean and wild. Just like the water is filling up this boat with the disciples and Jesus is asleep. Life is never, ever going to obey you, no matter how smart you are. Life is never going to obey you no matter how firm your grip on it is. Life has lost the key to itself. Hey, isn't that an optimistic message here, the first point? But this storm revealed something, that following Jesus was not going to fix the world. It wasn't going to fix them. And they were going to be faced with their greatest fear. Why would Jesus take them to the place of their greatest fear? There may be some of you in this room tonight that have been there where these disciples are, and you're scratching your head and you're saying, this is not what following Jesus was supposed to be about. Why am I still struggling with sin? Why do I still struggle with my doubt? Why is my family still so jacked up? Why did I get hurt? Why am I sick? Why did my mom die? Why did my dad die? Jesus, where are you in this? And I've seen this over and over again. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. You see these people and they quit Jesus because they say, you were supposed to do, you were supposed to hold up your end of the bargain and you didn't. It reveals something about this world. You can't fix it. 
but it also reveals something about Jesus. It reveals two things about Jesus, his power and his love for us. His power and his love. Listen to what one writer says, that there was a consensus point among the ancient culture that the sea was an uncontrollable power by any power but God. In ancient cultures and legends, the sea was a symbol of undestroppable, unstoppable destruction. The ocean in full fury was an ungovernable, inexorable power, and only God could control it. And so what happens in this story? I love this. It's hilarious. Jesus wakes up. And you want to talk about some sleep? How asleep do you have to be to be asleep on a boat in a hurricane? Like, what? Like, how is, first of all, Jesus is not just sort of taking a cat nap. He's in full rim, I'm out of here sleep, right? And he wakes up immediately, and he doesn't have to call on any other power. Like, he doesn't have to, like, harness any power. He doesn't have sort of Gandalf it. You know, Gandalf has to, like, do his thing and all this. There's no strain. He wakes up from REM sleep and says, stop. Boom. When I wake up from a nap, I can't even turn my phone alarm off, right? <laughs> like, I'm so groggy. I want you to think about just this power. Jesus is saying something. He, Jesus was in control of this storm. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew exactly where they were going, and he wasn't afraid of the storm, not even a little bit. And he wakes up immediately. And he takes them to their greatest nightmare. It's their greatest nightmare. To their greatest nightmare. And he says, quit. And immediately it does. That's, po that's power. See, what Jesus was doing is he was going to say, your worst nightmare versus me. That's what he's saying. The scariest thing that a first century person could imagine versus me. Let's do this. On top of this, let's make it even harder. I'm going to sleep. Like, Jesus, wake up. He says, don't you care if, that's what they say in Mark's gospel, don't you care if we drown? That had to be Peter. That was totally Peter. Like, wait, don't you care? Like, what are you doing? And he wakes up and says, stop. And it becomes completely still. All the gospel writers say it became completely still in an instant. It went from hurricane to glass. Ever been on a lake early in the morning and it becomes like glass and you could put your finger through it. You ever done that? that? That feeling? That's what happened. That's the description here. It went from scary, demonic, crazy nightmare hurricane to glass in an instant because of who was on the boat. It's because Jesus owns the Sea of Galilee and he owns all weather. <laughs> and so when Jesus says stop, it stops. It reminds me of my father-in-law. He's owned a bunch of different like Labrador retrievers and golden retrievers. And they're beautiful, wonderful dogs. But when kids are little, it's the most terrifying thing ever, right? Because they're slobbering and jumping on them and everything. My father-in-law, he's the only one that these dogs will listen to. And like my kids are going, sit, sit, right? Stop, stop. And it's like just dripping with slobber. And then my father-in-law will go, Maggie, sit. Whoop. Like, Why? Because he's, because he's the owner, right? And in the same way that Jesus Christ is the owner of everything, whatever is in your life right now, whatever has your number, whatever is overwhelming you, I don't know why it's happening, but I know that Jesus is the Lord over it. When, when my oldest daughter was like two, two and a half or three years old, we were down here uh, at the beach. And, you know, you're getting their first little taste of the ocean. It's so much fun. It's so awesome. And so she's out there, and she's kind of jumping up in the surf and then going back like this. And then one big wave just knocks her over, right? She gets sandy and salty and just tumbles. She tumbles over, right? And then she gets up, and she looks at the ocean, okay? And she says, stop it right now. <laughs> she does. Stop it. Like, points her finger and says, stop it right now. And the Gulf of Mexico did not even think about stopping, right? But I was thinking about that story. When Jesus Christ has stopped, the ocean stops. Why? Because of his infinite, eternal, and unchangeable power. That's what he, folks, that is what he wants the disciples to see, and it's what he wants you to see. It is uncontrollable for you and for me, but it is not for him. It's not. 
his power, and his love. What do we see as love? Well, the fact that he's able to stop the storm and the fact that he's willing to stop the storm. How do I know he loves the disciples when they call out, don't you care if we drown? Don't you care if we perish? Well, of course he cares. That's why he's in the boat. This may be one of the clearest places where you understand the incarnation, God becoming man. That's what that means. When God became man, you see him coming so near and so close that he's asleep on a boat so near these fishermen that the God of Psalm 89 and the God of the psalm that was read in the call to worship, the God who is the Lord over all the seas, is on the boat with them. That's why they're more afraid after he stills the storm because they realize who's on the boat with them. And the point is this. Reveal something about Jesus in the midst of your storm that we don't understand why we're in those storms. We don't like the storms. We're terrified by the storms. But Jesus is always in the boat. He's always in the boat. Wherever you're going, he's always in the boat. And how do we know that? Like, how do we know definitely that Jesus is always in the boat, that he's always going to be present with us in the storms because of his love in the incarnation? But ultimately, it's this. Jesus Christ faced the greatest storm ever, and it was the storm of God's wrath on the cross. You know that was the only time Jesus was ever afraid? There's only one time in, all the, go in, the, in the gospel, there's only one time Jesus ever shows terror and fear. One time. It was a place called the Garden of Gethsemane. He was so terrified that he would sweat. He sweat drops of blood. He cried out, if you could take this cup from me, if you would just take it from me, would you? He was so afraid because of what he was going to face was the greatest storm of God's eternal wrath against him that we deserved. And it terrified Jesus. But he took the greatest storm, which means every single storm that you and I face is nowhere close to that storm, which means he will never abandon you in your little storms if he didn't abandon you in the great one. Do you hear me? Some of y'all really need to hear this right now. Like, Jesus, why are you asleep in this? Why are you letting this happen to us? What are you doing What Jesus Christ did to the wrath of God and the justice of God was satisfied. Just like he made the Sea of Galilee into glass, he turned the justice and the wrath of God into glass for you. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You have peace with God. So it reveals about Jesus that he's powerful and that he's infinitely loving. And then it reveals something about us, doesn't it? Where is your faith, Jesus asked. Where's your faith? Now, folks, I didn't understand this passage for a long time. This one little verse, like, where is your faith? I thought he was saying, like, come on. I'm so disappointed in you guys. Like, get some more faith. Ah, oh, right? You kind of see Jesus sort of going like, ah, oh, come on. You. Jesus knows that they don't trust him. They don't know how much they don't trust him until the storm came. You know, that's what the storm reveals. The storm reveals that you and I don't trust Jesus very much. But what does it mean when he says, where is your faith? This is really encouraging. Really encouraging. Jesus isn't asking about how, uh, the amount of faith that they have. That's not what he's talking about at all. Like, where's your faith? Your faith is so little, like he's beating them up for having little faith. Little faith is never something that Jesus despises, not at all. Jesus is saying, where is your faith? Where is your faith, the object of your faith? Where are you looking in your trust? The storm reveals that we are looking at all these different things to take care of us in the midst of life, and we cling to those things. And the storm reveals that those things are gone. And Jesus is not talking about the amount of faith, but the object of faith. So many of us see faith as some kind of weird superpower. Like it's this mixture of like intellect and emotion. And if you can sort of drum up this thing called faith, that somehow you can go through hard things. Folks, as Horatius Bonar once said, faith 
is nothing. Christ is everything. You heard me say it tonight. Faith is nothing. Christ is everything. This is what it means. Faith is the only, it's what hooks you to Jesus. You don't look at faith. Faith is merely the, 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 the chain, the rope that hooks you to the one in the boat who's powerful and loving. If you're discouraged by you having little faith or imperfect faith, that your faith is weak, that you're, that you're hounded by all, by sin and by doubts, but that you have this trust in Jesus and it's a little bit of trust, it's okay. Do you know why? Because it's connected to Jesus. Where is your faith? Here's what's going to happen. When you go back home and you leave Shangri-La, that's what this is. It's awesome. It's wonderful. Jesus takes you out of your world so you can listen to him and be with him and laugh and enjoy his creation. And he sends you back. Jesus is going back with you. In fact, he's already there. So what do we do with that? What Jesus is saying in this passage, if he's saying anything, is look at me. Look at me. Don't just look at your storms. Don't just look at what you've lost. Lean. Do you know that's what faith is in the Old Testament? Leaning. Trusting is leaning. Lean your soul into me. Look at how powerful I am. Look at how powerful I am. Look at what I've done. I'm more powerful than anything. That's the things that scare you the most. Whatever's going to happen to you in your life is under my sovereign control. Jesus, he would go on to say that not a hair can fall from your head apart from the will of your Father in heaven. Not a hair. Y'all think about that. Not a hair can fall from your head. That God knows every time a sparrow falls from the sky. He knows every time a sparrow falls from the sky and a hair falls from your head. He's saying that whatever's going on in your life, you are not in the midst of a chaotic world that you somehow have to control and harness. You are in my world, and one day I will stop every storm. Do you see that? See, one day Jesus Christ is going to come back, and he's going to say to every storm and to every disease and to all sin and to all hurt and to all pain and to all crying, stop, be still, and they will. And that's your hope. You see, Jesus Christ gives us rest, as we talked about the first night. And Jesus Christ forgives us of all of our sins. He declares us righteous. Jesus Christ is the most glorious one, as we talked about last night, and it fills us with a glorious and a living hope that changes who we are by the power of the Spirit. But folks, what's going to happen is you're going to hit a wall, and you're going to think Jesus is asleep, and he's not. He's in the boat, and one day he will silence all the storms. Let's pray. Lord, thank you once again that we can talk about this story that has been talked about so many times in the past 2,000 years. Thank you so much, Jesus, for being on the boat with us. Bless, bless this group. Give, give everybody safety as they uh, go out tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.